morning, everybody. It's great to see you this morning. I'm a medical doctor, and I have a PhD in public policy, but I'll tell you, like many people here, so much of what I've learned is from other teachers, teachers outside of school. So my brother is smart. He's eager. He was always eager to learn. He was eager to make a difference. And in elementary school, he used to race to the front of the line. The week I was born, my brother was in the hospital with polio. And when he was in elementary school, he had two very large, very cumbersome metal braces and two large metal crutches that he used with his arms. And the teacher decided when he raced to the front of the line to take his hand and walk him to the back of the line and said to him, you'll be better at the back of the line. You won't have to worry about everybody else. So Steve took one of his metal canes and whapped the teacher across the legs and went back to the front of the line. Now, I'm, I'm not recommending violence here, but this was neither the first nor the last time he fought for his rights or the rights of others. So fast forward 20 years. I'm in Baltimore. I'm talking to this totally remarkable young woman. She's 21, and she's telling me about her education. Until she was 18, she had no mobility, no speech, because it required moving her vocal cords. And people hadn't figured out, the physicians hadn't figured out why she was locked in. She was now walking, talking, fully mobile. But she had been educated fully. For every year of school, someone had sat and taught her. Okay, so what had changed between when Steve went to school and someone wanted to put him at the back of the line and when this young woman went, and even though she could not respond, she was taught throughout primary school, throughout secondary school, and, and when she was able to move, was fully educated, a law had passed. A law had passed in the United States that guaranteed education for all. So I am not going to say that laws are enough. We all know they're not. But I open with that story before I show the slides to say we should never forget at the same time as laws aren't enough that they matter and that they matter deeply in two crucial ways. One. They give us a right to fight. Thank you. Um, and two, they make this big public statement that all children matter. So I'm going to show you some slides about where the world is on laws, but First, I'm going to say a minute about the World Policy Analysis Center, which I lead. So what we do is we map and track laws around the world that matter to equality, equality across all of its rich dimensions. And the reason we do is because when it's readily visible, just like when 500 CEOs stand up and make a public statement, other people see it. When you have maps that no longer hide which countries guarantee equal rights and which don't, we can move action faster. We can praise countries that are moving forward. We can give examples to other countries, and we can hold accountable those who are behind. This picture here is from one of the human rights commissions. It's a box of papers holding countries reports about what they did. The CRPD, a magnificent transformative document, 
but like other conventions, to have its power, it has to translate into countries taking action, countries passing laws, countries making changes at scale that affect everyone. And we have to make it easy to find. So that's what we do. We review all countries' laws. I'm going to show you some early slides. And for those who want to dive deep into data, we have an SDG data panel after lunch. But for the short version, I just want to say, this does not capture what I'm going to show you today, what courts have decided. This is just, is there a very explicit legal guarantee? Because we know those matter. So I want to say a word about this project. I'm going to, we have data on laws around uh, access to work, constitutional equal rights, civil and political rights, all measures of equality for persons with disabilities. It's on our website at worldpolicycenter.org. I'm just going to show you for now the education. We had an amazing group of advisors, and these slides are just to thank the groups and the individuals who spent time giving us input as we did this project. So I'm going to spend a moment longer on the first slide, and then I'll go a little slower on the others, but please know these are available to everybody here. They're captioned, they're machine readable, they're online as well. So these maps, if you are a blue country, it means you've got a great protection explicit in the law. If you're a red country, it means that that country doesn't. Maybe it has other protections. And I spent eight years in Canada, so my Canadian colleagues, I'm happy to have detailed conversations about what the Human Rights Act does and, and doesn't do, and, and the new um, Canadian with Disabilities Act. But that each of these, the blue are the strongest, most explicit protection. So what do we find? Discrimination to education, the very first step is to guarantee non-discrimination. And this is a good news, bad news story. The good news is over half of countries, 54% explicitly ban discrimination in education. And the bad news is where are the other nearly half of countries. Obviously, non-discrimination isn't enough. What a difference fully inclusive education makes. One of the things that our center does is it looks at when countries change a law, compares it to countries that don't, does it make a difference? And we go all the way down to individual lives, so we say, how, what happened to thousands of millions of children who experienced the past law and those who doesn't, didn't? This is just one example. Uganda's legislation for inclusion led to a 56% increase in children with disabilities attending schools compared to similar countries that didn't pass it. So how far are we as a world in terms of what measures of inclusion exist. And the first thing I have to say is we don't even know enough. There, we don't know enough, no one does, about all countries. What does inclusion really look like? What are the support services? Are all children with disabilities being included? But the closest measure we have, mainstream schools with support services, two-thirds of countries do this for at least some children with disabilities. Crucial start, but here too, what about the other third? We look not only at laws, which are the day-to-day -day implementation, but at constitutions. Why do constitutions matter? They matter because when new governments come in, 
has happened recently in the United States, government that said, maybe we're not going to take so seriously implementing disability rights because we have doubts about them. Constitutions are much more enduring. But the story about constitutions and, is that most of this map is orange and red because most countries don't have clear constitutional guarantees to education for children with disabilities. They have broad guarantees for education, but really explicitly saying a right to education for all children with disabilities, just one in five countries. And the map becomes virtually entirely red with only five countries guaranteeing integration of children with disabilities in school and only four in their constitutions, this is at the constitutional level, guaranteeing that it's physically accessible. So, I mentioned that all of our data is available on our website at worldpolicycenter.org slash disability. I wanted, before we end, to talk about what do we do with this and partnership. We're eager to partner with all of you. We have fantastic partnerships around the world with DPOs, with civil societies, with organizations, with UN agencies all around, can we do a couple things? One, let's ensure that every country signs the CRPD and that every country who has signed it puts the laws and policies in place nationally to realize those rights. Let's ensure that every country has laws, that there will be no discrimination, that full inclusion is a right, and once those laws are in place, we have to start mapping and monitoring at scale whether they're fully implemented. For those who are here from the technology side or the investment side, we are eager to create an app for phones so that every youth, when they walk into a school, knows their rights and can tell you if they're honored. So that every parent can tell you what their experience is with school and it will map up so that when we come back, we can show maps of are these being realized. Now I want to close by saying education does not happen in a vacuum. We have to worry about who are the teachers? Are workplaces, including schools, universities, truly places of full inclusion and equality for teachers, for faculty with disabilities? When children graduate, do they see the jobs and is the political participation there? I came to UCLA, which has been a great university to be at, but when I needed disability accommodation myself, I found that it was listed under risk management. I have to say, I didn't think I was a risk to them. I, I thought I was an asset to them. But the laws in place meant that even with that attitude, I could get the accommodation I needed, an accommodation that without which I could explain to them I couldn't run a center, I couldn't write 18 books, 400 articles, because I couldn't type, I couldn't use my, my typing is limited because of an injury. All of us are affected in different ways. We need many levers. We need the innovation on the ground. We need the civil society and DPO movements. And we need legal rights. Let's work together to make sure every child has them. Thank you.